Great news. Canada is awash in people wanting to be entrepreneurs. According to a recent Conference Board of Canada study, 13% of us are so-called early stage entrepreneurs. That puts us near the top of the list after the US and Australia. By comparison, in Germany and France, only 5% of the population is thinking of starting a business. Having said that, Jim Balsillie is deeply concerned by what he sees as a growing innovation deficit in Canada. And with that, we welcome to the agenda the former chair and co-CEO of Research in Motion, there's Jim Balsillie. Great to finally have you here. Great to be here, Stephen. Yeah, we've been trying to organize this for a very long time, but, but you're apparently busy. Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> uh, let me just get you, oh, first of all, I need to apologize to you and to the viewers. My throat's killing me today. You may have heard, there was something about a ball game or something. Really? It, <laughs> something, I don't know. Anyway, my throat's a little rough today, so apologies for that. How do you react to those numbers that say that we have a relatively high percentage of potential entrepreneurs in this country? Well, I think it says very clearly that uh, we don't have an aspiration deficit, that we are, in fact, very aspirational. We're prepared to take risks. We're prepared to uh, pursue opportunities. And I think that's a very, very positive cultural indicator. Does that suggest we have in our ecosystem here, our business ecosystem, some of the things that are required for people to thrive in this world? Of course we have some. We have many of the things required for people to thrive. We just don't have all of them. Uh, okay, we're going to go through the course of our conversation through some of the things you think we do need. The election. You're following the election. Here are what a few of the things that the major parties have on offer as it relates to what we're talking about now. The Conservatives say that they will implement a billion five Canada First Research Excellence Fund to support world-leading research projects. The NDP want to introduce a new innovation tax credit, make it easier for businesses to access government support for innovation. The Liberals promise to invest $200 million each year in a new innovation agenda to significantly, in their words, expand support for incubators and accelerators. Um, so it's, is it fair to say, it's not fair to say these guys are clueless when it comes to the innovation agenda, is it? Um, well, I'm not being uh, going to be pejorative or, or, or um, be partisan on that. But my comment is that our understanding of how an innovation economy uh, is incomplete and it's not updated. So these strategies are just tweaks of strategies we've used for 30 years, and they haven't worked. And so Canada's had zero growth in its innovation measured by Stats Canada over 30 years, in spite of hundreds of billions of dollars of investment. And all of these programs are just the same thing we've done before. I I'm all for good infrastructure. I'm all for incubation. I'm all for basic research. But it it's not going to address the core issue of why we, we abysmally underperform on innovation in this country. Well, let's start with that. Why, why has that mix of policy choices not worked? Well, the problem in Canada is that we have a discourse in the policy circles and in the business uh, uh, um, organization leaders in the political class that is really mired in 30, 40 years ago, uh, 20th century traditional manufacturing uh, economy. So they haven't updated their understanding of how an ideas economy works. So there's gaps and incompleteness in the approach. And until we acknowledge and address those gaps, we're just going to keep repeating the same mistakes over again and not get returns for our uh, tremendous level of investment. Who is the we that needs to get this better? Well, I think I just said it. One, I think the policymakers need to um, update their understanding for how an ideas economy works, and I've not seen that yet. The politicians need to understanding, and the, the business associations need. We, we have a, a, a weak uh, discourse on how an ideas economy works that just sounds like a traditional manufacturing economy discourse. And in fact, the ideas economy is tremendously different, fundamentally different than a, than a traditional uh, manufacturing or resource economy. So you need to approach it differently. And the nature of the policies and the nature of the discourse and the nature of the completeness just isn't there. And, it, and until we acknowledge that and until we update and change our approaches, we're just going to get the same abysmal outcomes. Well, a very basic question here. Why is it better for the Canadian economy to be manufacturers and promoters and marketers of cell phones as opposed to oil or timber? Well, I think I'm not making a case for one or the other. But if you're going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars in ideas economy, it should work. 
And if you have a large population that's betting their future on it, I don't think we should leave them at the altar. I think the third thing, which is actually the most important part of it, whether we realize it or not, or whether we like it or not, is technology is permeating absolutely every single business like oxygen. And so the resources business is going to be progressively more a technology business. Agriculture is progressively more a uh, technology business. Uh, pulp and paper and, and lumber is more a technology business. So if you ignore um, the role of technology and the ability to capture uh, wealth from your ideas, what you're going to see is the wealth you capture from traditional resources will become systemically under pressure over time, absent its cyclicality, which is obviously uh, difficult, and absent the fact that a whole lot of others think it's important. So I think it's a, it's a perilous approach to not pay attention to innovation and capturing money from your ideas uh, in the 21st century. So give us one idea that would make this work better. Well, the, the first most important thing is you have to up, update your understanding of how an idea's economy works. The, the, the goods, ideas move differently than tangible goods. Ownership is established differently and how you get money from it is fundamentally different. So if you don't understand how it works, then really you're at a loss. So I think the first thing we need to do is update our understanding, get a proper education of, of how it works and how Canada is not doing the kinds of things that other nations around the world, like Germany and Israel and Scandinavia and Korea and Japan and the US are doing. See what we're not doing. I think that's the first thing I would recommend. The second thing is that you, you cannot get an ideas economy working if you don't have a proper dialogue between the innovation companies and those that make the policy because the innovation economy is constructed only by rules. If you take uh, rules away, there is no market. And so you make the rules about prosperity and so you must have a dialogue. So those would be the two things I would say would get us started. I'm going to invite you to look at uh, the monitor over my shoulder here because we're going to play a clip of Victoria Espinel mm -hmm. speaking in 2013. She was then the U.S. Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator. There's a title. Uh, in uh, Barack Obama's White House. So let's play that clip and then we'll come back and chat. Roll it, please, Michael. Intellectual property is the cornerstone of innovation and America has always been at the forefront of discovering and bringing it to fruition. In last year's State of the Union, President Obama said, in America, innovation doesn't just change our lives, it is how we make a living. We need to make sure that we foster innovation and that we protect it. And intellectual property rules protect the rights of innovators around the country and the globe. Let me say that last line again, because it echoes very much what you just said. Intellectual property rules protect the right of innovators around the country and the globe. How do you, as a Canadian innovator and entrepreneur, react to hearing that? Well, I, I'm impressed because it shows how America Inc. works. Uh, America gets three and a half trillion dollars a year from uh, their ideas economy, and what they're trying to do is double that to seven trillion. And so they're they're pushing enforcement and broadening of rules through things like TPP to double that number. And it's impressive. They they have a strategy, and as she said, it's not only how uh, innovation changed America's lives; it's how they make a living. Wouldn't it be nice to have such a strategy and approach in Canada rather than just take the rules that the Americans foist on us? But I think the American view is, and you can tell me if it's right or wrong, their view is that their approach uh, is a universal approach and is not really an America first approach. Is that true? No, no, that's not true. I mean, that's a good way to say it if you want everybody to do what you want them to do. It's fundamentally lobbying and it's lobbying that advances their interests and it's fair and it's good and it's legitimate and if you're prepared to take that approach it's not a universal thing whatsoever. Innovation economy is a set of rules and you create the rules to advance your prosperity and if you can get people to take rules that advances your state's prosperity well good on you but my point is understand how the game is played, understand, have a dialogue with business where you know what rules are helpful and not helpful and get in the game and play shrewd and sophisticated. But that's what America does. It does so well. Uh, congratulations to them. And I'm simply saying, take a page out of their pay playbook and start playing with them. Don't just comply with what they foist on us. She's not at the White House anymore. She now uh, is the president of BSA, which I'm told is the leading advocate for the global software industry. 
and presumably she's had a few meetings with administration people on the issue of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and how it treats intellectual property rights. Do you have, um, have you been able to come to any conclusions yet based on what you know about the TPP as to whether or not Canada is well protected in that? Well, um, I think if, I think that the, the, the issue with TPP is it was done without consultation with Canadian innovators, so we don't know. And if you read the media carefully, there was a good story in uh, the New Yorker last week about how Silicon Valley got everything they wanted in TPP. So good on them. And we have no dialogue. I've talked to our main innovators in this country. None of them were consulted on TPP. None of them has any idea on it. So is it good? If it's good for Canada's prosperity, well, then that's, we're lucky. But it's kind of like playing darts blindfolded. If we're lucky, it's just because we're lucky, not because we took a systemic and deliberate approach to Canada's prosperity. I think our negotiators consulted auto. I think they consulted agriculture, but not innovators. Why aren't innovators at that same table? Well, I, I partly blame our innovators uh, because, and, uh, because they have to step up their role in, in, in saying what they want and, and that the passivity has not served them well. If, if the biggest, most uh, successful tech companies in the world are actively lobbying in every capital of the world, they were 108 and the top four were 108 times in Ottawa in the last two years. Our top two or three uh, hot companies are zero. So, of course, uh, Ottawa is going to take their message. So, you, know, you have to engage if you want to get the rules the way you want it. And I just I think a passive approach isn't going to work for anybody in this. It's non-engagement on the policy creators and it's passiveness on the, uh, the entrepreneur side. It can be fixed, but if we keep taking the same approach, uh, I, it, it, it's not going to work. Is part of the problem here, people can get their heads around the notion of the TPP adversely affecting, let's say, the family farm or the auto manufacturing plant that may be a couple of miles down the road, but the notion of dealing with intellectual property is a, is a bit of a bridge too far. Is that part of the problem here? That's exactly the main problem. You've hit the main problem right on the head, is that the ideas economy is fundamentally different than a, than a traditional manufacturing economy, and people have to understand that. <clears throat> so I'm going to try a little bit of a minute to explain that here. Um, goods, you, you only have a market for ideas if the government puts a bunch of rules around. Because, for instance, intellectual property protection is a bunch of government rules. And it's by a bunch of laws and a bunch of agencies. And it's managed by a bunch of courts. Copyright is a bunch of rules. And so they're changed and modified dozens of times every day. So it only happens, the market, is if you manage it by the government. And so this idea that a, an intangible ideas market uh, is similar to a traditional market it's the complete opposite. And in fact, when you put in a new rule, it's a constraint. So the words free trade and open trade and intellectual property rules are contradictory. So you're using the exact wrong words if you use a traditional market to describe an ideas market. And you're right, it, it, it is something that many people aren't familiar with because we don't have a deep well of innovation companies putting it in the discourse, lobbying for it. And so it's a bit of a chicken and the egg. And that's why I'm trying to talk about it here, is saying you need to understand how it works. You need to understand that it's created by rules. And, if you, and, and it's totally different than a farm. And if you don't understand that, then you just keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. And that's why I, I keep saying we need to update our understanding. Because if, I, if, you, if you get this one thing I'm saying here, then you're on your way. But if you don't get it, will just keep repeating the same problems. I presume, though, you're a guy who has spoken to, and we don't have to name names here, but prime ministers, finance ministers, those kinds of people, about this argument. When you say this to them, what do they say back to you for the reasons that they have not moved on this yet? Well, I, I think we, um, I, I've, I've tried to say it as clear and respectfully as possible. We need a dramatic, updating in our understanding of how an idea's economy works in our public service, in our business associations, okay. in our and political it class. And it hasn't happened, no, and, they it hasn't. and they tell you, Jim, here's why it hasn't happened, or here's why we can't do what you want. What's, well, what is that? What happens far too much of the time is they put forth 
false myths, like because we're a small economy or, or a resource curse or we haven't had a war for 200 years or there's a complacent culture or we're not risk taking or there's not enough risk capital. So people go to uh, making excuses and, and, and I'm saying, but none of those are true and they can all be addressed and they're not substantiated by any search, uh, research. The second thing that happens is people move it to levels of abstraction. Like, oh, if we just had more capital or if we, had, if we thought more bravely or if we had more public infrastructure, it's all going to um, appear. And what people need to understand is uh, an ideas economy is constructed and you structure a business model. That's what I did at RIM. I created a business model and I defended it and I went to capitals around the world and built an infrastructure out of the country. It was, a, it was an engineered business model. It was an engineered profit and then you had to advance it and defend it in a competitive world. And, and so it's not talked about in levels of general abstraction. It's very specific. It's very surgical. And so I would say that is far and away the most important thing we, we, we need to do is, is stop talking about it in generality, stop talking about it in abstraction, and get to real tangibility of how you can, what rule can you take, make, or what technology or, or what regulation will help some company perform better in places where it has an opportunity. You know where they're doing that? You know where they're doing it with tangible specificity? Uh, oh, I read this in one of your columns. Google visited the White House 230 times since Barack Obama became the president. That's an average of once a week. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us, and the other part of that is, guess what, they've also been in Ottawa 50 times in the last two years. Mm -hmm. so, um, so people who think there's a free market for technology, what exactly are they talking about when they're in the White House every week and they're in Ottawa every other week? They're, they're lobbyists like everybody they're else. They're lobbying rules. They're trying to change rules to favor them. And absent uh, other, our company saying the rules that will help us, we take on other people's rules. And, and then they push a narrative that says, well, this is a global standard. It sounds so good. But in fact, no, it's just the rules they want. What do you say to those who are already suspicious about the fact that, that business and government have too tight or too close a relationship, and that makes them very uh, suspicious? Are you talking Canada or the U.S.? Well, it's certainly a problem down there, but how about even here? Well, it's AWOL in Canada. It's AWOL. In the ideas economy, yeah. No, I, I suspect it's there. I know it's there in things like dairy and oil and uh, um, agriculture because you see the nature of the policies and the lobby groups. But when is the last time you've seen anyone from the ideas economy in Canada uh, be factored or articulated? Whereas in the U.S., yeah, uh, Robert Reich just had a book on saving capitalism. He, he talks about... In that chair a week Well, ago. he talks about what they're doing is saying, these guys have gotten too powerful. Hmm. And my point is, in Canada, they're too weak. <laughs> so I, 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 would, I would wish they be, become that powerful that we have to rein them in. But right now, they're so weak that they just have to get game ready. Is it problematic to call for an increasing national defense, if I can put it that way, of Canadian innovation in an increasingly globalizing world. Is that problematic? Well, the thing you have to understand in, 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 the, in the world of ideas, they move very differently. And the rules can swing the whole fate. One rule can swing the whole fate of a, of a company. So the nature of ideas companies have, have very much become intertwined with state actions. I was the Cana a Canadian on the U.S. Business Council, the only one. Uh, the, my last two-day meeting, the first whole day, was the State Department in with all the top CEOs in the U.S. How do we advance and protect your intellectual property around the world? So it, it happens in every country around the world. There's a tremendous interrelationship between the ideas economy and the state because it makes the country wealthy and powerful. And if you're passive, then a single company's going into an America Inc. infrastructure or to a, a Germany Inc. Infrastructure, infrastructure. So we're naive to think that one doesn't, I'm not saying fortify and turn inward, mm -hmm. but be strategic and, and, and be game ready. Update your understanding of how 
the game is played. And for those who would say, you built a pretty damn successful company without any of these rules in play, what's the answer to that? Well, I had to build an infrastructure outside of Canada. So I had 100 to over 100 lawyers reporting to me in Dallas. I was down in Washington every month working the, the DOJ and the State Department and Commerce and the White House. I was on the Digital Advisory Committee in Brussels, working uh, Brussels very actively. So uh, I had to build an infrastructure outside of uh, Canada for RIM to scale. Without it, we wouldn't have grown. And so uh, I mentor a number of entrepreneurs, and, and I, I, I do talk to the industry. The probability that they will replicate that infrastructure outside of the country by themselves is not high. And more importantly, why isn't it there in a 21st century sophisticated innovation economy called Canada. So that's why I, I say with credibility and experience, um, we're missing gaps here and they can be created, but they're completely AWOL in this country. Grim grew because we precisely built outside of Canada what wasn't in Canada. Is there another RIM-like Canadian company that you see on the horizon today? There is no chance there'll be another rim until we fix this infrastructure. If we fill in the gaps and fix this infrastructure, there's many companies that can be global successes. But if you send them uh, with fundamental gaps in infrastructure, by definition you cannot scale because people will start to change the rules and start to change the ownership and start to change the regulations once the money matters. So if you're not able to contend in there and sustain your position and advance it in both the innovation and in the ownership commercial, commercialization realm, you'll just get an engineer out of the game. There'll be a, there'll be a regulation or a, a standard body where they'll recarve out the, the profits. You won't be there. Okay. And, and there was an article by Danny Bresnitz in the, recently talking about how they set standards with all the countries in the world and they don't invite Canada. We don't show up. Two last quick questions. Number one, any desire to run another big with global reach Canadian company? Growing uh, a tech company is very demanding. It, uh, it, it, it takes really all you've got and it, and it owns you. It's a beautiful experience. You get to change the world. You get to prosper mightily. Uh, but, uh, you know, life is precious and uh, I'm more interested in seeing the next great entrepreneurs take it to the moon. And if I can show them by helping, they've asked me to chair this lobby, help show them how you interrelate lobbying and commercialization and this whole next gang can take it to the moon, that would be something that I would love to see more than anything else. And finally, have you got the bug of owning a hockey team out of your system yet? Yeah, yeah, oh, that was, I haven't had a meeting six years on this. Uh, yeah, no, no, it was, it was a good business opportunity, but no, I haven't followed up with it one bit since then. Uh, if you can't make money, I wasn't interested. As a Hamiltonian, I gotta say, it's so too bad that didn't happen. <laughs> it really is. But anyway, that's another show. Jim Balsley, really good of you to come into TVO tonight and help us out with this. Thanks so much. Pleasure, Stephen. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.